Roberta. It's a party. I'm the bomb. Oh, cool. It's just a fun conversation. It's totally fine. Anything stupid or embarrassing or career wrecking that you say will just go in the outtakes. It's totally fine. Don't worry too much. Cool, I get to hear them. Oh! Uh, no. Oh boy. Ow! Oh dear. Do, do we have an intro? Because I haven't written one this time. Welcome to the Troublesome Terps, the podcast that isn't afraid to cover topics that keep interpreters up at night. Our entire back catalogue, the story of how this podcast came to be, and much more can be found at www.troubleterps.com. But now, on with today's show. In the blue corner is the man from beautiful blue and white Bavaria, the ever so sunny Alexander Gansmeyer. How are you doing today, Alex? Pretty good, thank you. Um, the blue white corner I quite like. So we were just discussing off mic for everyone who's listening to do a Bavarian podcast. So if you want to hear that, let us know and we'll make it happen. <laughs> exactly. Be sure to subscribe to the post- podcast so you don't miss that very special episode indeed. <laughs> And over in the Fuchsia corner, we have the hero from Glasgow, the troublesome Jonathan Downey. Good evening, Jonathan. Good evening, Alex. It's good to be back home. I was in Warsaw for four days. So it's nice to be back in a country where if I don't understand people, it's just because they're Glaswegian. (laughs) Yeah, that's true indeed. (laughs) Okay, my name is Alexander Drexel. And over in the red corner is our very special guest for today. A conference interpreter hailing from beautiful Brazil, Roberta Barroca. Roberta is not only a Portuguese English interpreter, but she also experiences the most outrageous things in the interpreting space, from peacocks in the booth to talking to a younger self, falling in love with Frank Sinatra and what an eject button would do for her sanity. Welcome to the show, Roberta. Thank you very much. Beautiful intro. Thank you. I'm glad you like it. It's great to have you on the show. I hear you really like Mondays, Roberta. Is that true? And, and why is that? It is true, and that is something that inter- becoming a freelance interpreter has taught me, is uh, appreciating every single day. Um, as my days are all different, um, I appreciate it when I have an assignment, but when I don't, I, I know some interpreters that go berserk when they don't have work. It's like, I don't have work on Monday, oh my God, oh, yeah, how many assignments do you have following week? I have, oh, I have four days, oh, come on, shut up. You have four days, you're complaining that you're off on Monday, get a life. Right. <laughs> People are like that sometimes. So so I really enjoy being off like today. Excellent thing that I'm off because I was able to have this meeting with you guys. So I try to appreciate every single day, whether I'm at work or a day off. That's true indeed. That's actually why I brought it up, because we are recording this episode on a Monday, a very beautiful Monday, at least here in Brussels. Uh, I don't know about you other guys, but uh, Alexander, why don't you tell us, why, why do we have Roberta on the show, actually? Well, because Roberta is a fantastic writer, and just in case you haven't seen her articles, you should really go and check them out on her LinkedIn page. Um, you cover a wide variety of topics, Roberta. I don't really know where you get your inspiration from on those topics, but it feels like you're always drawing from from real life, if I may say so. Is that true? It is absolutely true. Uh, I think my articles, they come from, an, from a place where I feel something that either bothers me or draws my attention in a way, but that I can't tell the person exactly what I think sometimes, you know? <laughs> so, so I just, I just, it's kind of a, a way to vent and also to send a message, but without, you know, no naming names. I never name names. Yeah. People, sometimes they send me private messages saying, who exactly were you talking about? I'm like, uh-uh, <laughs> that's the million dollar question, never answering that. <laughs> so that's where they come from. Yeah, because you still want to have jobs in the future, right? So you you want to keep it anonymous, <laughs> ideally. Exactly, but it's that's where they come from. I mean, each one has a different story, but yes, uh, all of them come from something real, and and that's happened to me. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and the topic we want to cover today uh, is is booth manners. It's a topic that we have talked about um, in the past. And Jonathan, I'm just wondering, was that a topic that was brought up during this conference in Warsaw at all? 
Um, not really, because there weren't a huge amount of interpreters there. It was um, the Translation and Localization Conference in Warsaw. And to be honest, if a translator gets annoyed at the person that they're working next to, it's because they have multiple personality disorder and the angry guy has shown up. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's the Jekyll and Hyde thing, right? But it, I mean, it's one thing I noticed recently. Um, two weeks ago, I was in London doing my very first paid consultant interpreter job, and I had a new booth mate. Um, and suddenly I realized how much of a sacred space an interpreting booth is, and how the first half hour of any job with a new booth mate is basically going to decide how the entire day, or even sometimes the entire project, will go. Um, thankfully, it went great, and um, she came highly recommended from one of my from my favorite ever Spanish interpreter and my favorite ever Italian interpreter. Um, but it it did make me realize how dangerous the interpreting booth can be if you get it wrong. And reading Roberta's articles, sadly, it's kind of given me flashbacks, which are really really worrying. How how bad the flashbacks get? <laughs> All of us, I guess. All it, it, yes. Especially <laughs> the, the the diva thing. Um, and I know we're going to get into that in a minute. It's amazing how quickly you can spot a diva. If you look on their coffee cup that they bring in, how many of the boxes have been ticked and how many extra notes did the barista have to add to their coffee cup tells you if you're dealing with a diva. <laughs> but can we just say real quick that diva actually in Roberta's article was standing for the delusional interpreter's vain arrogance syndrome. Exactly. I wonder, Roberta, do you think it's contagious? <laughs> what I say, it's it's contagious, yes, but it's also reversible. I mean, if that's good, <laughs> there's a cure. <laughs> yeah, it is. There is a cure for diva. It, there is one. And the funny thing is, you know, I don't think any of us are immune to that because we're all human and we do have our egos. So it would be very arrogant of us to think we're, you know, I oh, know I've I have my ego under control. That would not be true. Uh, otherwise we would be all enlightened individuals and I don't think that's the case of us here talking but um, and the thing is I remember a moment in my career in which I, ha I had so much work and I had so many clients things were running just so well for me and um, I was I almost fell in that pitfall of becoming a diva um, in the in, in the sense that I became I did become a little arrogant for a while but then I had to I was, I'm kind of in a transition, moving to a different country, and, uh, you know, many things happened in my life, which served as a way to make, make me feel humble again and, and put myself in the position of the beginner once again. Because when you move into a different country, you can have a, an amazing name in whichever city you are, but if you move to a different city, state, or country, you have to build your career pretty much again, because... From scratch, yeah. Exactly. Nobody knew who I was, you know, when I was arriving in this new market. So I have, I had to pretty much send emails to a bunch of people and saying, hi, I'm Roberta. And, uh, you know, would you like to grab a coffee? And so that, that was actually true from the diva story that I almost didn't get any replies. You know, there was like one friendly soul who said, yeah, sure, let's grab a coffee. Let's let get to know each other. But other people just plain ignored me. And I was like, would I do that to a beginner like in the past? And I was like, yeah, I might have at some point done that. So so I write the articles also for us to um, it, it's not I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. I'm just bringing um, to surface um, mistakes that all of us can make at some point in our careers. But we have to pay attention to them because we don't want to be assholes, right? <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> Very well put. We don't. We don't. And, and the other thing is um, I've had – I used to teach interpreting in Brazil. I don't anymore because I don't have time, but I used to for a while. And I remember looking um, at the students as if I were so superior to them, you know, because I'm the teacher and you're just here learning from me. I'm the bomb. <laughs> and uh, at some point – some of these students, some of these students became chief interpreters. They started hiring people to work. And guess what? They didn't really remember me because I was the, you know, I, I was the asshole that they had met as a teacher. You know, and it's, 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 it was excellent, actually, because it's an amazing, it was an amazing lesson for me. 
amazing and things have changed amazingly since then. I've, I've been an interpreter for 10 years, so I'm talking here about maybe six years ago, right? Uh, I have been a nice person for the last <laughs> maybe four years. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a pretty good track record. Yeah. But it's, it's, okay. it's tricky as well, right? Because I, as you just said, Roberta, it's, I think it's very easy to fall into the trap that, you know, maybe things are going well and you, you think you're on top of the world. And sometimes we don't even realize that we may be, you know, arrogant towards others or maybe not um, being as friendly as we could be or should be. I mean, exactly as you write in, in the article. I'm just wondering if, the, if there's a good way to, I mean, w what is a good way of preventing ourselves from falling into the trap? I mean, one would be to read articles and just use them as a mirror to, you know, look, look at ourselves and, and reflect on our own behavior. But also listen to the Troublesome Terps podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> For sure. Uh, I'm sure may, many people who read The Diva, some of them read it and thought, oh, I know some divas. But I'm pretty sure other people read and, and asked themselves, mm, am I a diva? So, so yeah, I think, I think that we have to talk about it because nobody talks about it. Nobody is like super open. Let's talk about this. There are so many people who really turn their back in the beginner, in, to the beginners. And the beginners are the ones who are going to be the future chief interpreters. And right. you're going to be old. And you're going to be forgotten. <laughs> and hopefully you're friends with, the, with, the, with that guy that was a beginner a few years ago. You know what I mean? Well, exactly. And I think there's there's another big trap um, that many experienced interpreters fall into because they think, well, these young people, they come into the market, they steal my jobs, they steal my clients, um, which maybe is understandable at, at first glance. But on the other hand, they will also participate in the market. And I think if they start writing emails to us as more experienced colleagues, I think that's our opportunity to teach them or to, to make sure they work according to the standards that should exist in the market, be it the price or the, the way we work and the kind of working conditions that we're trying to make sure we get. So I think that's also an opportunity for us to just make sure that the market works properly. Exactly. Yeah, bringing them on board. Because if they do feel that they're excluded, they're just not going to abide by any rule whatsoever. They're, they're going right. to... Everybody has to make a living, right? I was going to inject a little bit of um, trouble into this, and I think... A couple of things keep me humble. One is, is one is I'm in a very unstable market. Many of the markets outside the big conference cities, no interpreter in the market that I'm in can make their living just from interpreting. So we all do something else. And the fact that that's the case means that most of us in this market are really humble because we don't get the, uh, I'm sitting on so many clients that I could basically be mean to five of them and it wouldn't matter. Um, we're all going, okay, we constantly have to think of where's the next client stream going to come from. And that, that keeps you very humble. Uh, one other thing that really struck me in that traditionally in interpreting, we've had this model of the more experienced, more, more established interpreters teach the young ones. And, and that works and should work. But one of the things that I've noticed is happening is the younger interpreters, especially those being trained in universities that are doing practical research, are coming into the market with a slightly different mindset than some of the more established interpreters. And actually, in some cases, that new mindset just could be just what the profession needs. And it's a case of being humble enough that even if you've got 10 years of experience or however many years of experience, being able sometimes to listen to the new people who might say something controversial, but it might be just the right thing. Exactly. Makes sense. You know what I think about the young folks as well is that sometimes they just have more, well, not more drive, but they're really driven still. So they're really going out there trying to get new clients, maybe even in creative ways, maybe through social media or some channels that otherwise the more experienced interpreters wouldn't necessarily have thought of and might not even necessarily need. So, you know, I think at some point, and I think, Roberta, this is going back to what you were saying earlier as well, where you had so many jobs and, you know, you, you kind of move to a different space. And I think sometimes you forget that, you know, it's going really well right now, but it might not go really well next month. So you still kind of need to keep up your whole client routine. And I think oftentimes young interpreters are still really hungry. You know, they're still really hustling for, for that. And I think if you can actually form a team between the youngins and the, uh, the experienced colleagues, it can be a really beneficial relationship for everybody involved. Absolutely. And also with the new technologies, I think also the, the, the new interpreters or the younger interpreters, they are also more tech savvy in general. So, 
you know, you, I, I always learn something new from my booth mates. It's amazing. And especially if they're younger than me, they, they teach me so much when it comes to tech things. Like it's, it's good to be, um, keep an eye open for that or else we're just close ourselves in our own little world and only, own little thoughts and don't learn in advance. There's another thing that is kind of related to this, which which I wanted to say, because in your article, you describe the situation of a young interpreter who's trying to enter the market and, and establish contacts with the, well, more established interpreters. Um, and, and I think email is probably a good way of doing that, especially when you arrive at a city, you're new in a city, maybe you don't know anyone. But maybe another chance is to go to social events as well. I know, at least in Germany, that many professional associations organize like social evenings, not necessarily CPD events or training events, but also just, uh, you know, social uh, get together where you can just have a drink with someone. And uh, usually it's it's very flat hierarchy. So you can talk to the established colleagues that you've heard all kinds of things about, and just, um, you know, have a drink with them. So that's maybe a good opportunity as well. That's true. And I also think the good thing is with those established colleagues that are at those meetings, they're usually the ones that are very approachable. Because if you're, like you were saying, Roberta, if you're an asshole, you're not really going to show up to those kinds of gatherings because you either feel like you don't need it or you don't want to spend the time or you think everybody's just trying to get something from you. So I think the people who do go to these events are actually like open for conversation, open to an exchange of any type. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's a really good idea to go to these things. I always encourage people to. Yeah, the networking events, also the conferences are great for that too because it, it's it's the same rule as going for a uh, for a hap for a happy hour. The more established interpreter is only going to the happy hour or to the conference if he's willing to deal with the with the newcomers. Otherwise, they just think they're too good. Even for the conferences, I, I see like in the American translators association conference which i tend to participate almost every year um so the diva interpreters they don't go that much because they don't think they need it even for the conferences they don't think they need it so oh which is terrible <laughs> makes me angry in my experience diva interpreters turn up to anything that's got some kind of procedural power behind it so, you know, if you're a diva, you're going to love to arrive at meetings with an armful of paperwork going back 15 years um, and saying things like, well, we never did that in my day. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, the, the interesting thing I, I was actually just at a conference, as I said, the interesting thing about conferences and get togethers is, especially if it's not in your home city, everyone walks around for the first 24 hours with a really confused look on their face um, and with some kind of deep-seated insecurity to begin with anyway. So the first day is a great time to get to talk to people because only the people who live within about five miles are feeling, feeling in any way confident. So even if you were a diva, um, having to negotiate local traffic and local public transport is enough to reduce you to your knees anyway. So, you know, can, everyone's humble for that the first 24 hours. I, I, I love the fact that you pointed out that we all have the capacity to become a diva, and I think... I was actually had some colleagues from Brussels over visiting last week. Um, and I think we came to the conclusion that to survive as an interpreter, you need self-confidence bordering on arrogance just to survive in the booth. And the problem is when you start treating people the way that you, that you have to treat your job. There was actually another colleague from, from back in my time in the UK, and he was saying a good interpreter is an arrogant interpreter. And I was like, I'm not sure... That's what? What you, yeah, I'm not sure that's what you mean. And he was like, no, no, no. You have to be Ooh. incredibly confident. You have to tell people off when they don't respond the way that you want them to. So you have to be an, no. an arrogant interpreter. And I was like, oh, I am not sure that's exactly what you want to be. You know, you want to be confident, but there, there's a fine line between this and the other. But, uh, you know, he wouldn't be persuaded. And it showed. But he was just rationalizing his own behavior, I suppose. I think so, too. I think that was the justification for, you know, him being him. That didn't really work out for, for them, I think. Yeah. I, I just called it developed confidence and also the fact that as an interpreter, you have to become a fake, fake expert on anything within a week. Yeah, exactly. Mm. <laughs> uh-huh, true. I have, a, I have a BA in journalism. So for me, that wasn't that scary because in journalism, it's pretty much the same. When you write for a newspaper, or whatever you have to, you have to become an expert in whatever the matter is in a couple of hours sometimes. Yeah. 
So that wasn't the that wasn't the scariest part of it. But the thing with the articles is, you know, it's, it's really as you said, it's it's really about acknowledging that any of us can fall into any of the pitfalls that I draw people's attention to. Like if if you've read the the list of uh, interpreters, the types of interpreters, when I mentioned the hologram and the power napper, uh, the peacock interpreter, for instance. I mean, I've been a power napper. I've taken a nap in the booth. Has anybody here taken a nap in the booth? Nope. I can't. My booth meets with Kim. No, I can't do that. Never. Never. Never, ever, ever. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Roberta. You're on your own. <laughs> I, I, have, I have done it. And, well, the, the good thing about me is that I don't snore. So, I mean... See, I was just going to say, I didn't, I haven't, I've never taken a nap in the booth, but my booth mate actually, there is one who tends to take naps and that's just, you know, everybody knows it. So that's just kind of what he does, which is totally <laughs> fine. But at some point I was in the booth with him and there was like this super intense board meeting, you know, they were rattling down their financials and everything. And I, it was my turn, which is totally fine. But he was sleeping and all of a sudden I hear like, <laughs> <laughs> that is the problem that's the problem with the yeah. napping i mean the, the napping can be absolutely harmless i mean uh, i have many friends many interpreters who are friends and they want they t they tell me listen are you okay do you mind if i take a 15 minute nap i'm like no go for it the problem is when they yeah. go oh. yeah and that, yeah, that, that is the only problem. One, one, the last time I worked with this guy who took a power nap, I had to wake him up. I was like shaking him, like, please. And oh then I God. wrote in a huge post-it, they're like, you're snoring. Right. You know what the issue is though with the snoring? You know, it wasn't even that the client might have potentially heard it. The issue was that I almost had to laugh so hard. And it took me, it took like all of my willpower to not just like crack up in the booth. I, I, mm. I, have, never nap I have never napped in the booth, but has anyone had that feeling? When you come off like a nightmare shift, yes, and you you hand it over to your booth mate, and like you don't tap the mic off, you basically hammer it off, and you probably break the console. And there was one time I'd finished such a difficult shift, I walloped the mic swap button because I was like, I've had enough, and I meant to gently place my head on the desk, and I think I actually did a little mini bounce on the corner of the console. <laughs> so I've now I've now learned that if because um, my practices i would i will never completely turn off when i'm off shift and um, so what i'll try to do now is if i need that five minute break i've now learned to rest my head backwards and not let it head desk yeah and no matter how awful the speaker is just in case i whack the console because my nightmare is one day i'm going to bounce my head on the console and turn my mic back on yeah and that, that would just be horrible <laughs> ow just, just let me see if I understood that you've been like hanging, banging your head on the con what was banging your head on the console? Yeah, that was the other type of interpreter you didn't mention in your article. That's the that's the heavy metal interpreter, the head banger. <laughs> <laughs> the head banger, the head banger. That's a really good personality for an interpreter. It was ju it was just at the end of a horrible shift, and I meant to just gently rest my head on the desk, just. You know, as a physical thing of, give me a minute, and I rested it a bit too hard. And I've now learned, if you're going to rest your head, like don't nap in the booth because your booth mate might need you. But at least if you're going to take your five minutes of that was really difficult, rest your head on your seat, not on the desk. <laughs> <laughs> Pro tip. <laughs> right. So, Roberta, I, I have a question to you about, you know, especially that article, uh, the, the divas and the the holograms and peacocks and Sinatras. I wonder what kind of feedback you get, because I've, I've written an article or two talking about, you know, do's and don'ts that I find a bit annoying sometimes with certain diva antics. And I've gotten very positive responses to that, but also some quite negative ones like, how dare you say this and how dare you say that? And this is what we need to do. And I'm like, well, not really. So I, I wonder what kind of feedback you get. Like, is it a mixed bag or is it unanimous praise? What's what's happening? Yeah, I get, I get mostly positive feedbacks, especially from my friends who say, wow, I didn't know you could write and all that. So... And other people saying, that's nice that you're raising the awareness of people regarding s such important topics that nobody talks about because some of them are pretty much taboos, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, but I did get a, some um, um, 
I was frowned upon in some of them. For instance, the OCID, which is the Obsessive Conference Interpreter Disorder, is an article that pretty much creates a disorder for interpreters, right? Yeah. It's a totally fictitious, satirical article. But the first version of it mentioned uh, two actual diseases. I mentioned anorexia at some point, and I also mentioned Tourette syndrome, saying something like, interpreter, like if you've come to a point, like uh, I, I divide the, the disorder into three levels in the spectrum, mild, medium, and severe. I think it was in, in the severe uh, side of the spectrum in which I said something like, if you can't sleep anymore, and if you fi suddenly find yourself uttering uh, bad words into the air, and then in parentheses something like Tourette syndrome, uh, you probably have the severe type of uh, OCID. Then when I posted that to LinkedIn, immediately the first, res the first feedback was like, oh, it was this lady from Mexico, and apparently she's also a psychologist. She's an interpreter and psychologist. And she was like, shame on you, um, you know, mocking diseases, mental diseases. These people already face so much um, prejudice, and you shouldn't be mocking them. And I replied to her saying, listen, it's a fictitious, it's a satir satirical article. It's not supposed to be taken seriously. That's, that's when I added to the title a little disclaimer there saying a satirical article not to be taken seriously. And then, <laughs> but I also... Gotta take precautions. Yeah, yeah and the, the funny thing is I, I, I would have never imagined. It's like it, it, it's so far-fetched that somebody would think that was real. <laughs> I was like, listen, it's... I'm just uh, making analogies, but I changed the article so as not to offend anybody. The idea is not to offend anybody, of course. And uh, and then another friend of mine also sent me an, a message saying, "Listen, I think da 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 because you're talking about mental disorders." So, so that was I think that one was the most controversial one when it comes to having to like having a bad feedback. But a lot of people loved it and, and, and totally got the joke, right? A lot of people say, oh, that's hilarious. I love it, blah, blah. But sometimes you might touch a sensitive spot there. We have to be careful with that. We never know people's backgrounds. And so, you know, but it, com it comes with the, it comes with the writing. If, 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 I'm, if I were to write stuff that everybody talks about, because I, there's a lot about interpreters, conference interpreting, learning for students, beginners, there's a lot, but it's pretty much more of the same. That's what I've, yeah, more of the same. So my idea was I want to, I still want to write about this because this is what I know. So I want to write about this, but I want to do it differently in a different way from what most people are doing. And I think the important thing is that it comes from a good place, you know, like you're not trying to be mm -hmm. vicious with your articles. And, you know, if people bring something up, like I felt that, you know, you shouldn't have mentioned this with the with the mental disorders, you've changed it. You know, it's not like you're being defiant and saying, oh, you just don't get the joke. Like you actually respond to people positively and react to the feedback accordingly. So I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. I don't I, I really don't want to offend anybody. And I and I always make a point either at the end of the articles and today I said this to you guys in the beginning of our um, little interviews that um, I myself have made mistakes. So it's, I am really not pointing fingers. I am saying all of us can do this at some point. Unfortunately, I hear of, none of you have ever napped in the booth, which is almost <laughs> quite hard to believe. <laughs> but I'm telling you, I mean... Uh, eight out of ten interpreters here in Brazil take naps in the booth. And also the markets are different. You know, it's much warmer in Brazil. That must be it. You know, like you get sweaty. It's Yeah, it's very drowsy. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> I think people are a little more lax maybe because we, 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 the only thing we do is like we look at our booth mate and we say, are you okay? Can, do you mind if I take a nap or do you mind if I stay outside the booth for your 15 minutes because I need to make a call or something like that? So unless the person is really having a really hard time or it's a super difficult medical event, then we wouldn't. But there's a lot that we do that it's okay if the booth mate leaves for 15 minutes or closes his eyes for 15 minutes because we're pretty much handling it, right? 
So it's a case. It's on a case by case thing. It really depends. It's okay. Here in the UK, apparently, we have a history of people falling asleep in the voting booth, so we more more than make up for it. <laughs> So just in case you want to take a nap right now, feel free to do that. We are going to take a quick break with this episode, but don't worry, part two of our episode with Roberta is waiting for you in your podcasting application or on our website. So if you do want to continue listening right now, feel free to do that. 